Hi, and welcome to the Decision Vision podcast. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a prologue before you listen to this podcast because I don't want to be accused of false advertising. Um, the discussion is about the nature of work and the changing nature of work. And, and we had a terrific discussion with, uh, with Joanna Bloor. And, and you know, I do hope that you will listen to this, even though the topic is a little bit different than the way it's represented, the way it's presented in the introduction. Um, we had originally thought that the discussion was going to be around um, labor models and uh, to a lesser extent employee engagement, um, but really adapting to new realities generally in the labor force. And the way that the conversation turned, and I decided that it was a good turn, so we just sort of ran with it, is really talking about at a high level uh, employee engagement and, and how do you unlock the full potential of your employees as thinking organic human beings. And, you know, if, if you don't think that's a good thing, then you probably don't want to listen to this podcast because we're going to talk about things that are going to just, you're just not going to really jive with. But if you think that is something that's worthwhile, and I, I know a lot of people that, you know, come to me and say, you know, boy, I'd love to get my, I'd love to get my employees to think on their feet better. I'd love to get them more engaged. How do I do that? then I think you're going to find this conversation to be very interesting. It's kind of like a TED Talk, uh, but a little bit longer and with no slides. Um, but I, I think a very high-level intellectual conversation. So we'll go back and, and take another look with a different episode at actual models of work when we can do something a little bit more specifically. But um, you know, I, I, I don't want to have you go in 20 minutes and wonder kind of when is the topic that was advertised coming up and, and waste your time. I want to be respectful of your time. So um, if you're going to listen to another podcast, thank you for doing that. Otherwise, if you're going to stick around, sit back and relax and uh, enjoy the infotainment. Welcome to Decision Vision, a podcast series focusing on critical business decisions. Brought to you by Brady Ware & Company. Brady Ware is a regional, full-service accounting and advisory firm that helps businesses and entrepreneurs make visions a reality. Welcome to Decision Vision, a podcast giving you, the listener, clear vision to make great decisions. In each episode, we discuss the process of decision-making on a different topic from the business owner's or executive's perspective. We aren't necessarily telling you what to do, but we can put you in a position to make an informed decision on your own and understand when you might need help along the way. My name is Mike Blake, and I'm your host for today's program. I'm a director at Brady Ware & Company, a full-service accounting firm based in Dayton, Ohio, with offices in Dayton, Columbus, Ohio, Richmond, Indiana, and Alpharetta, Georgia, which is where we are recording today. Brady Ware is sponsoring this podcast. If you like this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast aggregator, and please consider leaving a review of the podcast as well. Um, today, we're going to talk about the nature of work, um, a, a seemingly esoteric topic, but one that is getting increasing attention, and it's, it's receiving increased attention from uh, a number of angles. One, there's a macro social angle that is forcing us to revisit how we consider work because we are finding increasingly that more and more of us are becoming, uh, if not expendable, then certainly ancillary to technology that is now capable of performing more complex tasks than were even imaginable 10 to 15 years ago. And to that end now, we are experimenting with different uh, uh, different economic systems to help us uh, to help us cope with that, frankly, uh, without necessarily having to uh, to sabotage technological progress because there are very re real reasons we want to do that. Uh, and, and you know the so-called Star Trek economy is, is great, but they don't show you kind of the painful transition that gets you from this economy into that Star Trek economy. And, and that that painful transition is. You know, what do people do when robots do everything that people want? And uh, people are, you know, some countries are now experimenting with something called a universal basic income. Uh, there's at least one Democratic presidential candidate who uh, is embracing that as a way to cushion the blow. But we're forcing to reexamine the, the role of labor, if you will, in our economy and our society because, it, you know, automation is not only – expanding, but its rate of acceleration is, is, is increasing as well. And, and then at a micro level, we are, we're being compelled to reexamine 
what work looks like because you know we are particularly in the american con- american economy in an unprecedented level of competition in many areas not not every area to be sure but certainly in in professional services and other areas um you know we have competition from places we never would have dreamed we'd have competition before whether it's china whether it's india um whether it's startups um whether it's again you know ai um we are being forced to to rethink what role labor is really meant to play in the workplace and then you know at some point because there's really a limit to how much uh how much you can improve your labor force by simply raising pay um and 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 increasing the value that you extract from your labor force by doing that it's it's compelling us to rethink models of work whether that's working from home whether it's the 4 day work week or the 4 hour work week as we sometimes hear about uh job sharing and flex time and the gig economy and so forth and these are all they've all been around to some extent but they have not been sort of up close uh in person and in our faces the way that they have become in the last 5 to 10 years or so and if you're a business owner and an executive or an executive and you're not thinking about this um you you need to start because this is a hard puzzle to solve and if you do solve it then you're going to create a significant competitive advantage for yourself. And if your competitors solve it before you do, watch out. Um, so as usual with all of our topics, I'm not the subject matter expert. I'm just the person who brings on the person who is the subject matter expert. And to help us work through this today is Joanna Bloor, who is expert and founder of the Amplify Lab. Um, Joanna Bloor is on a mission to help us prepare for the big leap into the future, to uncover and articulate our value and our place in the next chapter of humankind. Why? Because we all need to rethink how we prepare for the future of work. The what, where, when, and how of work is changing, and so is the who, and I would argue the why as well, and we'll talk about that today. It all starts with the understanding why and how you need to have a better answer to the question, what do you do? Um, an eternal student of what is around the next technology corner, Joanna started her career by scaling the revenue strategies of brands such as Ticketmaster, Cars.com, OpenTable, and Pandora. Then a conversation in line at a TED 2016 led to a realization that what we are known for is far-reaching impact as an individual and as a leader. In front of audiences that range from thinkers at TED to technologists at Dreamforce to entrepreneurs at Gathering of Titans like a fairy godmother – Joanna's known for live amplification of audience members while zinging the audience with moments of surprise and laughter. And, and I can attest to that. We had a preliminary conversation to come on here. It, it seemed like it was two minutes before we knew it. An hour and a half had gone by. All wrapped up with the practical guidance of what you too can do next. And as a testimonial, jo- Joanna shines a light on long forgotten ingredients that make up our secret sauce, reminding us that we're not awesome by accident. And that was by an executive from Salesforce.com. Joanna, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to continue our conversation. Yeah, so let's get people caught up uh, because otherwise they're going to be jumping on a treadmill going at 30 miles an hour. Why are we having this conversation? I mean, is you know, did what I say make sense in terms that we're being confronted with just this need to reconsider the very nature of work? Yes, yes. Well. I was thinking about this as preparing and how do I, how do I kind of macro this up? Cause you talked about um, the Star Trekian future and how do we get there? And in looking at work and I actually think you know, lots of people talk about the future of work and how do we get there? The reality is, is I think we're actually here today. And part of the, the challenge that we see our whole marketplace in, and I, I will start by saying what is, really interesting about work is it's a double-sided marketplace. They are buyers. The the employer chooses the employee. The employee chooses the employer, which adds a whole level of complexity and questions and everything to the entire thing. It's not like you're, you're buying a pair of shoes that you get to walk out the store with. But when I was thinking about this whole question about well, what does work look like in the 21st century, I really actually took a step backwards and said, well, what has happened to work over time? And then separated because 
um, how humans travel through work, how business is run and how technology is run um, potentially have different patterns. And what I ultimately noticed was that if you look at, well, if you look at technology, um, most technology companies are running around and saying, you know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And I go, okay, so we've gone from the the original industrial revolution um, when we saw the shift from farming to, you know, factories and all those sorts of things. And, you know, technology has had an enormous play in that. Um, but I would argue that the human revolution hasn't happened yet. So while technology has gone through major shifts and trans- transformations, and I would actually say that business has started to, to make some sh- major shifts and transformations, um, humans haven't. And so you look at, so let's just say, okay, if we're just going to use the base model of the industrial revolution and, and how business and technology has run. The past was very um, one-dimensional and at best binary. So you think about how companies grew, it was all about supply chain optimization. It was all about operational efficiency. It's all about um, growth and what does your P&L look like? And are you returning investment to whoever's investing you, whether you're public or private or whatever the, the financial structure is? And yet, and if you look at um, technology, it's gone from very... Um, ones and zeros to we're now in the world of quantum and AI and um, gosh, robotics and all sorts of really multidimensional things. And business has too. And, you know, you talk to any company today and they're starting to think about up to triple line, triple bottom line economics. And so both technology and business has become much more multidimensional. And when you look at the human element, all of the, tools, the elements of humans, resume, job descriptions, performance reviews, um, measurement of productivity, measurement of almost everything is still very binary. It's still, do you have that skill set? Do you not have, don't have that skill set? And what I think everybody, and I know everybody will be listening, is going, wait a second, I'm way more interesting than just the skill set. And I go, yeah, absolutely. You look in a business, and I think any business owner, um, any leader would say the most multidimensional interesting thing in my company are the humans, and yet all of the tools and the supply chain about how we navigate that marketplace um, are very one- and two-dimensional, whereas we're in this, this multidimensional world. So I sit here and I say for human beings, we aren't in the fourth industrial revolution. We're still trying to get out of the first industrial revolution. And I think what we are starting to see with the gig economy and um, people really pushing back on companies around where are they investing them with them and career path and all of the elements that come into play when you're talking about humans um, are really beginning to change. And the question then becomes as because it's a double-sided marketplace as both a leader a business owner, whatever your role is in this, or as a team member, how do you start thinking about how to change the narrative about you and say, look, the re- a resume isn't the thing that tells me who I am. A job description isn't the job. Um, and how do we start thinking about talent and more, much more of a multidimensional structure? Then you start talking about, like, how will that happen? So, although this is... I think subsiding a little bit, I think we're past the point of peak blame, but you still sort of hear it plenty is that we're only having this conversation because millennials and Gen Z's are, are basically modern day hippies without the tie dye shirts and they don't want to work hard. Is that, I mean, is that a, you know, what do you, how do you react to that? Is that a legitimate analysis or is that just a cop out? No, I think that is the same argument every older generation has about the generation before. Um, plus, let's let's be real, because I wanted to say this out loud: like millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, Boomer, it's just a marketing category. This is just a sticker and a label that we have put on people. And 
yes, as human beings, we do need to categorize things, otherwise our heads explode. But um, nobody wants, unless the sticker is really, really good, like winner of X or um, the bet at Y, um, we don't actually like to be labeled. And um, so, first of all, I I always talk to teams and say, like, let's step away from the stickers. And let's also recognize, you know, I was, um, for lack of a better term, a, tw- a punk 20-something-year-old myself once upon a time. Um, and I was running around saying, well, hang on, why are the rules the way they are and on what's happening? This is this happens, I think, with every single generation. Um but where I do come back is and say, like, where are the labels actually helpful? So I'm now going to disagree with myself is um, I do think as you are looking at the talent in your organization, we do need to actually give a bit of a nod to um, what has been, in essence, the career path. And I say this kind of air quotes around it of the talent that, come in, that comes into your organization. And the reality is for all of us, our career path actually starts when we're little teeny tiny kids and start going to school. And, you know, I'll use my, my, so I am, I'll give myself the sticker of Gen X. Um, No, I was brought up in a generation in the, you know, my, my formative years when I started to actually realize there was more than just play out there. We're in the eighties. And if you think about what life was like for a Gen Xer in the eighties, there wasn't a lot of after-school programming. Uh, we were the first generation of parents of divorce. And so there's a concept of a latchkey kid, which is kids who used to go home after school and let themselves into their own homes. And while we all did just fine, we kind of had little to no parental supervision. Um, and at the same time, saw the boom and the bust of the 80s. You then roll those same people into the 90s where the internet started to become a thing um, and technology became such a major part of young people's lives. We were the the first adopters of technology and were the first people to be described as digital first. What was true about that period, and especially for those of us, you know, including myself, who got to really be in those early stage companies who were building the internet. My first, I want to say, dot-com job was in 1995, but I had been playing with technology for fun for, gosh, almost a decade before that. And what was true about that era is there were no rules, uh, you know, from, I'd say, 1995 until the present day. Um, every single job title I have had has been made up. Um, and every single job description I have had is made up. And I say this for myself, but that's the same for my entire peer group of people who ran through through that period of time. And I say all of that because what I think it means is that anybody who that resonated with um, can sit here and go, well, hang on a second. I'm really used to there not being rules and rules are made to be broken and a job description is just a suggestion. Um, and really, I am going to sit here and say, how can I play with technology as opposed to asking about career paths? And then I flip it around and say, well, what is that same narrative for people? And instead of giving them a sticker, let's say, you know, anywhere from 30 to 35 and younger, the reality is, is both their education and their entertainment, um, because it was the age of fairness, it was never about here's a trophy for participation. It was a, here's a trophy for playing as a team. Um, in an age of what I saw a fairness in their education and entertainment, you have an entire generation of people who've been brought up both in school, where at the beginning of school, they're told, this is what you need to do to get an A. Here are the rules. And you think about even sports and other games, it's very rule-based. Um, and this is what you do to succeed and level up and all of those sorts of things. And then you look at entertainment too. And even the most simple and basic video game. Um, and I will absolutely own that I do play Candy Crush on airplanes while I'm taxiing out on the runway and need something to do to distract my mind. Very simple, basic video game. I'm right um, there with you. Is the video game. <laughs> God, we, we, you think we'd find a little time to meditate or something during that period. I'm not afraid about that. But you look at that and in video games, 
Um, if you break the rules, you die. Oh, but FYI, you also get four more lives. And so when I looked at those patterns and then also look at um, the boom generation, and I sit here and I go, why are we surprised that um, the talent that is coming into our organization um, is sitting here saying, tell me what the rules are and I will do it, but then I will expect a level up. Um, and then you have an entire leadership team who's saying, but hang on a second, rules are made to be broken, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I sit here and I go, this is why I think there's a bit of angst between some of the generations because we've had different experiences and different patterns. But I also sit here and say on a much bigger level, I actually think um, the generations coming into the workplace have it right. Um, I do think their questions around what is the right measure of success are the right questions to have. What does success look like? I do think they're right to come in. Like I know they, they're given that really terrible moniker of snowflake. Well, what's true about that is every snowflake is scientifically different. But the reality is as human beings, we are all incredibly different. Um, and that's actually what is amazing about human beings. And so I then sit here and say, well, hang on, we're all right in this scenario. You should learn how to break the rules and everybody is different. And so I sit here and go, well, the supply chain of the industrial world, which is scalable, repeatable, mechanistic, um, it's about productivity shouldn't be applied to humans because we're this much more organic, evolving, changing things. And so I say, kill the resume, kill the job description, kill all of it. And I know the next question is like, well, what do you do then? Um, and actually start to look at, well, what is, how do you look at your talent, which is, again, for any company, probably the most important thing that you have and say, well, how do we actually shift the supply chain of human talent? And instead of coming in and saying it's about stickers and badges and tenure and skills and all of those sorts of things, and actually look back again in time to the world before the Industrial Revolution and say, wow, hang on a second, when you were um, somebody in the workplace prior to, what is that, like late 1800s, um, they had the equivalent of an internship. We were all artisans and we all learned a craft and um, apprenticeships. And, and there was a lot more of a almost currency transaction beyond currency when you went to go work for somebody. So if you were an apprentice working for a ma with, with a master, and I will say it was with more than four, there was an expectation that it was more than just a paycheck. Um, and so I suggest that, you know, the workplace actually becomes much more like school and say, okay, as talent is coming in and as you're having the conversation around the multidimensional changing human and the value of this human, how do you then start to think about, okay, so if the job, job description is actually trying to solve this problem, what is the combination of skills that we are looking for? But then starting to ask the question is what is the potential that we are looking for? Because you are, you're looking for somebody's ideas. You're looking for somebody's brain to come into the conversation. And that has much more of apprenticeship model than I think the employee model of today. So let me, let me jump in on that because. Uh, okay. I, I th there's a there's a lot to unpack there, and, and we may just spend the rest of our time kind of unpacking that, which is fine. Um, but but a a thought that occurs based on what you just said that I think I, I think is an important a critical takeaway <clears throat> is that the nature of work and the way we structure it really is about making it easy to get rid of people. When you really boil right yeah. down to it, right the 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 job descriptions. The, the leveling up, so to speak, and I, I love that term, by the way. Um, it's really all about protecting the firm from being basically attacked by the employee instead of, um, well, how do, if instead, what if our approach was, 
we're just never going to be sued by an employee because we're just going to focus our efforts on making them good. And, and therefore they'd be nuts to sue us <laughs> and we'd be nuts to fire them. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I've had this, yeah, I've had this conversation with a couple of like the conversation around like, let's get uh, my first conversation was let's get rid of the resume because I just, I think it's such a single dimensional document and, people spend far too much energy and the HR executives I've talked to across the board have said, Oh, but we need it so that we don't get sued. And while fairness in employment practice and appropriate employment practice, I think is critically important. Um, and really understanding who a person is, is critically important, but any business owner would tell you that if you are putting in a practice so that you don't get sued, you're actually limiting yourself rather than expanding the opportunity. So, um, you know, let, let me let me ask this: is that is that tug of war? You know, one thing we're hearing a lot more about now is is mental health in the workplace. I'm, I'm I'm a big advocate for for mental health. I think it cannot be talked about too much. Um, you know, is that tug of war between the desire of employees to to grow and to develop versus the firm that is trying to protect itself from its own employees it, is that is that literally driving employees crazy that's a really interesting question yeah not a psychologist not a me neither a doctor of just any, you and me it, talking so, here <laughs> just you and me chatting I, my my only inclination is to say of course it is um, you know, there's been endless studies around the whole carrot and stick science of reward for employees. And you come back to what I said earlier about how both, you know, the what is it you need to do to get an A, how do you level up within your application, that feedback loop that we've all gotten a little bit addicted to, of well done, you got a gold star, you're the champion on the leaderboard, like whatever it is, that, that feedback loop has become so easy um, that when we're not getting that feedback loop within our workplace, we start to get anxiety around it. Um, you know, am I doing okay? Um, is everything working? And then you add on the fact that um, the challenge of business is there isn't always a right answer, um, which comes, which speaks to that multidimensionality and the fact that um, unless, actually I would argue, I, I think about like, what is the product of the human being in the workplace and it's their brain time. And even if you are, you have an employee who's working in a retail store, you want them there to think critically as opposed to just being a robot and a machine. And yet all of the things we have surrounding humans process, the feedback loop, the what are you doing? How are you doing it? Um, really talks to us more like we're machines rather than these really interesting human beings. And, you know, think about from a consumer's perspective, if you have a question or a challenge What's the most infuriating thing you can hear? So, well, that's the rule and I can't break it, right? Or if I do that for you, I get fired. And that, that more than anything, just, you know, it makes me want to take my phone and smash it, except, except it's worth as much as my wife's engagement ring. So I'm not going to do that. But, um, (laughs) but, but, you know, but, but that, that thinking, that brain power is what leads to satisfaction. Yeah. So I just want to give a real example about this because I don't want to sit completely esoteric on this whole um, scenario. So I'm actually going to talk about a, uh, a retail environment, a, a situation that I just encountered. So let's talk. I want to just kind of lay the land of what's out there. So you have an entire, um, just a group of people who have been taught over and over and over again through time, follow the rules, follow the rules, follow the rules. They come work for a company and uh, I mean, you use, I'm not actually going to say the name of the company because I don't 
had a conversation with the CEO about this because I was curious. But it was a uh, a food service company that I was interacting with, and clearly they had they had done a really innovative process with food um, that was part of the experience of the food eating process. That's about as far as I can go on it. It was a really fun store, and I was excited to be in there. Um, and I went in to buy the product, and the person behind the counter said, well, what is your name? And I said, well, I'm literally buying the process. You're not making anything custom for me. It's, it's in this package. I just want to walk out the store. Why do you need my name? And he goes, well, but that's what I'm supposed to do. And I was like, well, I don't ask. Like, can we just do the – I was in a rush. <laughs> can we just do the credit card and run out? And while that was a very simple – easy transaction, what stuck with me afterwards is I said, gosh, if I was GM of this company, I was the CEO of this company, I'm not, um, what I would want my employee to know that they had the wiggle room to do is actually take the critical thinking and say, hey, look, this woman rolled in, it's clearly moving at 100 miles an hour, it's kind of the only pace that I operate at. Because she's not getting something custom made for her, she's actually just buying a thing off the shelf and literally wants to swipe and go. Well, I'm just going to put Bob in the machine and who cares? Because it wasn't um, it wasn't a data point where it was, oh, they want my email address so they can send me marketing materials. It was literally to make their process work better. Um, do they have the bandwidth to break the rules to say, hey, I'm just going to skip the process and actually see that my customer across from me wants to move quickly and service that need as opposed to serving the need of the company. And I know that seems really myopic and an individual, and I sometimes wonder if when I describe it, I sound a bit like a whiny customer, which maybe I am. Um, but I sit here and I say, as, a, um, as somebody who understands the retail experience, as an example, I would much prefer the employee who understood that the rules could be broken there and that they wouldn't actually get dinged, punished, whatever, for not just being a cog in the machine while it is a very complex machine that they are running because they're doing all sorts of customizations and all of that sort of stuff. And I sit here and I go, that's this structure of here's the job description, here are the rules, here is the process, here are the expectations, here's what's correct, here's what's incorrect is really making our employees into machines more than the amazing thing that they really are. And so how does a how do you actually help people understand that the rules can be broken while also recognizing that we have brainwashed people into saying that you have to follow the rules? Like I think we've just roboticized the workforce because you might get sued because you want to move faster because of all of these sorts of things. And I come back to, okay, we have got to shift into this more multidimensional space. And again, I could go on, on all of these sorts of things. Well, let's drill into that actually. So I'm, I'm just going to tear out the script and to be perfectly candid, we're not talking about what I thought I would talk about today, but I think this is really cool and we're just going to roll with it. Okay. And, okay. and, and that is because um, the question we're really driving at, because you've uncovered something I think is, I think is important and I think that business people and executives and owners want to know is how do you de-roboticize your workforce, right? Everybody's subject to this roboticism and, and even, even the places where we don't want people to be robots, look at, look at customer service representatives, right? We all know they're looking at a screen and based on what we tell the, the, the CSR on the other end of the phone, assuming they're human, is that there's an algorithm in front of them then telling them what the choices are they can give back to me in order to try to resolve whatever it is they're trying to resolve, right? So even they're, they're robots. It's just that they're, they're the, 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 there's a human interface to a robot, basically. So what are, what are maybe let's, let's go with number three. What are three things that an executive should be thinking about if they're concerned that their, their workforce is too robotic, too going through the motions, too rigid, and, and encourage them to, you know, be the thoughtful, organic beings that is, the, is there in our nature? Okay. Big question, but I will try and get it to three. So the first one I would say is really looking at, so if, if, you, if you know that you are currently getting 
roboticized humans. Let's just call them that for right now. The result that you are getting from your current process is roboticized humans. Then I sit here and I say, like any product that you are looking at within your company, look at your purchase process. What is, you know, if, if you were buying software, as an example, which is in essence what is the same thing you're doing, um, you would have an RFP process and you would say, like, um, what are the nice to have? What are the not to have? Like, what is that entire purchase process that you are going through? And my guess is for any company that if you sat, really sat and broke it down and said, like, what is, and let's think about the, the sales process as a whole and the sales first process, the sales funnel starts with um, how do you get in the consideration set? What is that first step of consideration set for you? And is it, what it is today for most people, which is resumes and keywords and all of those sorts of things. And maybe that is the right set of criteria to get somebody into the consideration set. But then I sit here and say, okay, then there's the evaluation process of purchasing somebody, which currently sits in sometimes with recruiters, sometimes with just the hiring manager and say, like, are we actually interviewing for lack of a better term, a robot or are we interviewing for critical thinking? Um, and and in the customer service world, like what is what is it we're actually asking for? Um, and taking them through that. And so really looking at your purchase process of somebody's brain time and saying, like, what are the different things that we should be looking for as opposed to what is the you know, what does the machine look like? Which I think on the machine side tends to lean more to what are your experiences in the past? What is your skill set? Um, you know, I'm going to use a, a really, I'm going to actually use myself as an example of where I threw a, a purchase process completely out the windows for a company when I was early in my career. You know, I was a manager of a high level, high end swimsuit store where I think yeah, it was like, $100 to $200 for a swimsuit sort of situation um, and had through people that I knew gotten an opportunity to interview for a dot com where I was going to shift from selling swimsuits to selling websites. And in today's world, I absolutely would have not made it through the consideration set because while sales was a consistent skill set, absolutely nothing else on my resume said anything about media, said anything about um, understanding how to sell to small and medium sized business, like literally would have not made it through. But because I knew the right people, et cetera, et cetera, I managed to get the meeting. Um, and in the process, um, I could hear, and now I look back on it, I could hear the VP of sales really having a hard time trying to bridge my, my experience in the past with what he needed for me to be a critical thinker for in the future. And we were getting really stuck on a conversation about objection handling and did I know how to handle objections in the media space? And I remember saying to him, quite sassily, you know, I've been selling and I held my hands up and I said, I've been selling pieces of fabric this big and my hands are fairly close together to women this big and I moved my hands apart. And I said, and making them feel great about themselves at the end of the day, I don't think objections are my problem. Um, and that started a whole hilarious conversation where we really talked about how I, we transferred how I think about selling swimwear and what was the decision-making process for a customer in a swimsuit store and how did I bridge that to how that would also manifest in this whole internet world because the internet didn't really exist at the time, all that sort of stuff. And so I was given the opportunity to make that bridge and that required them to rethink their buying process and and it worked out because, I mean, it worked out for all sorts of reasons. So I sit here and I say, how do you think about how you were buying people and not necessarily saying, look, in my RFP process, they need to be this exact thing, go to this exact school, have this exact skill set, because unless you're having that conversation, you can't bridge. So that's the first one. The second one is really understanding as an employer um, that you're – like your employer's data job, they don't marry it. It is a, it is a transaction. You are renting their brain. And, and right now in the robot world, if it's just a cash transaction, 
then, of course, well, the only things, like, let's look at how are you measuring success in the robot-based world. The only things that you can sit here and say, like, this is where I can show success for the employee is compensation and title. And I sit here and I say, well, gosh, if you have a real conversation with an employee, the, is compensation and title important? Absolutely. But is everything else important too because they're much multidimensional? Absolutely as well. And so I look at it and I say, like, you are, if you are working for somebody, then you're an apprentice with us. And as an apprentice, and you're an apprentice for a, I don't know how much time I'm going to get with you because it is a double-sided marketplace and my employee might choose to leave. And so how do I sit here and say, where can I add value that actually helps them much more intrinsically to themselves as opposed to just saying, well, I'm going to add value by adding a ping pong table or bringing in lunch or whatever the cool sparkly thing is today. Or I'm going to adjust the conversation and or title and actually come back and say, like, who is this human being um, and how can I actually help them? And I know people say develop and grow, but it's not just on their skills to make them more of a, a human, but actually develop them in their thinking approach. How do you help them evolve? Maximize. Yeah. And like, how does this, oh, and now I'm going I'm to jump the shark for a second because I sit here and I say, like, I have been, I've spent the last, I mean, I've been obsessed about this whole idea for decades. But, um, and I, you know, a lot of this whole narrative and how do you think about talent was really forced upon me as an executive at Pandora because I had a team that went from 30 to 400 over three years. Um, with revenue numbers that were around a hundred million annually to a billion dollars annually over that same period of time. And so everything was moving at a ridiculous speed. And then the, the majority of those 400 people were maybe second job out of college, 27, I think was the average age. And what I realized really quickly was I couldn't promote every single one of them every six months, not physically possible. Right. I couldn't give them a raise every single six months. And then so coming back to this whole, how do you have a conversation with about who they really are and what is their value to the organization completely shifted the narrative around who they were and what they were all about. And as the executive in charge, I would literally go around and be like, this is why you are important and this is why you are important. And we'd have a conversation around their value. And it had a dramatic difference on their engagement, their tenure, their ability to collaborate with each other, all of those sorts of things. And that's what, when I sit here and I say, like, think about them more as apprentices and that you get to, you get to borrow their brain and how do you do that? But what I saw in not only doing, getting that hand forced at Pandora, but then also as I started to really study this phenomena out in the real world and started to build the Amplify Lab was um, that I say 99.9% of the people that I engage with, and it doesn't matter if they are 18 or 60, um, have no idea who they want to be when they grow up. There's a tiny percent of people who go, oh, no, I have complete and utter clarity about who I want to be and how I can get there. Or well, actually, not necessarily how they can get there, but actually what that thing is. Or if they have an idea of who it is they want to be, because and again, I'm going to come back to the, what is the experiences of the, the younger, and I say younger, I'm an old lady, younger generations, is there's so much feedback today. Like, I just got tagged two times on Instagram today, and I was like, oh, look at that. I got an instant feedback. Um, there's so much feedback on am I successful, et cetera, et cetera. People are then also terrified of breaking the rules, which is, which is also part of the problem because we are these multidimensional people. Um, and so, so I just sit here and I say, like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I really jumped the shark a tiny bit there. But no, no, well, ahead. actually, you segued because I think I think then the way to summarize that is is the third that third principle is really get to know your employees and and yeah. get to know them for who they are, not what their resume says they are. Right, and it's it's not get to know them and say like, how are your kids and all of that sort of stuff. It's and thank you for helping me bridge it back, it's get to know them 
but also get them, help them see themselves um, and see who, what their potential could be. Um, there is, and I have absolutely no doubt that every single one of your listeners has, has a person, whether they have worked for them or not, that they have engaged with where they've gone, wow, this person has enormous potential and I'm going to put my relationship capital on the line for them and open doors for them and make connections and guide them. Some people might call this mentors. I think that's the wrong thing. I think they are sponsors because yep. when you are putting your own capital on the line, it's a little bit different, but we sit here and we look at this contract of potential um, and that is what is what we're all looking for. Reverse that transaction and say, okay, who are the people who saw that in your personal career path up? And I'll tell you today, if any one of the people who put their, who opened doors for me, who taught me things that made me better, that said, gosh, Joanna, here is your potential. If they picked up the phone today and said, hey, Joanna, I need something from you, or hey, Joanna, will you come work with me on whatever it is they're doing? I would drop everything and go do stuff for them. And you sit here and as a manager and you say, okay, how do I get my entire organization to be that excited to work with you? It's because you have seen the potential in them. And it's that Again, it's coming back to that double-sided marketplace. And for those of, if anybody is listening who is an employee, I sit here and I say, like, consider that in who you're working with and that, yes, we absolutely want you to do a good job and there's stuff that needs to get done, but we are hired, we are promoted, we are given opportunities based on our potential and it is justified by our past. And so having that whole conversation about potential and not only for um, the individual, but what is, what is it their life that they want to go down and how do you get to know them and know that it's not just, although again, because we live in this robotic, we live in this binary business construct, how do you take just title and compensation off the table and have a conversation about what, what will actually stretch you, help you grow, help you learn. What are, you know, what are your potential? What is your potential? Where am I seeing patterns of something that you're uniquely good at that maybe you haven't even considered? And instead of, you know, being almost myopic and saying, I'm going to follow this career path to be X. And that's, of course, you want to be a physician. And then I think the rules are a bit different there. Um, but how do you, how do you get off that path and actually start to pattern what has happened with business and technology, um, which again, I'll say they have shifted and use some of their, some of the business constructs of agile development and um, beta testing ideas and redeploying one part of the organization, another part of the organization. You would take all of these constructs and do them with human beings as well, which allow for a much more multidimensional workplace. Like, some of my favorite team members and all of my jobs who worked with me were ones that I gave to other departments and said, I think they'd be really great for you. Well, yes, they don't have any experience in fill in the blank here, legal, finance, creative, employee development didn't matter. Um, but they show the potential in this space and helping them move into that space. I've now got an ally in another part of the company who we've got this great relationship with and, it always ends up paying off and allows the person to actually start to make more of a portfolio of who they are. So Joanna, as I, as I predicted, I blanked and about an hour has gone by. Um, so we will have to continue this at, at some point, but I want to thank you so much for coming on and having this conversation. If somebody wants to pick this up with you, how can they best reach you? Well, I am across all of the social medias at, at Joanna Bloor. Um, I have them all, so come find me anywhere there, or um, they can go to joannabloor.com and find out how to contact us there. Um, very easy to get through. Clearly, I can talk about all of this ad nauseum, and I'm like the 
like the snowflakes they are, we are all different, so we all have different questions. So it's important to think about how that is, how that looks for you. So before we go, I am going to test your your social media street cred. Do you have a TikTok account? Uh, that no. Oh, no. that's a shame. I know. Uh, I am too. Uh, you know, I am too aware of uh, data and data privacy issues. In my former life, I was an ad technology executive. Okay. Um, I have yet to be convinced that that is an environment where the data of me is actually where I want it to be. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to hold off on TikTok. I, yeah. Well, when you do, it hopefully is, you'll do something. When you do, yeah. since you're a child of the 80s, as am I, I'm hoping you'll do a Pat Benatar cover and then make that available. Perfect. Done. So that's going to wrap it up for today's program. I'd like to thank Joanna Bloor so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. We'll be exploring a new topic each week, so please tune in so that when you're faced with your next executive decision, you have clear vision when making it. If you enjoy these podcasts, please consider leaving a review with your favorite podcast aggregator. It helps people find us so that we can help them. Once again, this is Mike Blake. Our sponsor is Brady Ware & Company, and this has been the Decision Vision Podcast.